Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. I am so, so, so thrilled to have our guest, Joshua Becker. Joshua, welcome. Oh, it is good to be here and to meet you, Kate, for the first time. We uh, we chatted a couple minutes just to make sure the mics were working, but other than that, this is it. It's nice to meet you. This is so exciting. And the K-Squad I know is just beside themselves right now because we we love your content. And we made that clear, right? After I did that video on de-owning based on the concept that you shared, they all went over and told you you had to come visit. You uh, you made it clear that the K-Squad knows where my channel is. That is <laughs> that is for sure. It was very fun and um, flattery apparently has quite quite an effect on me. So it is, uh, well, it is good to be here. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I love that obviously your content is impacting us, right? So that's why we're watching. That's why we're, that's why we're reading. That's why we're, we're reading your blog. But I also love your silly side. One of my favorite videos that I've watched was the one where you and your wife respond to negative comments. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Did that, did you think of that like kind of because like the, the celebrity mean tweet thing? Is that, have you seen those before? Oh yes, I have. And yes, I'd seen those before. And I'm sure that factored into my, factored into my, into my decision-making. But, um, so I've been blogging for like 14 years on my own little website. And then I started YouTube, uh, two years or so ago and man, the comments from my blog versus the comments on YouTube were really uh, not night and day. Like there were a lot of positive things, but man, the comments on YouTube were like so negative compared to what I what I get on my on my blog. I suppose because it feels a little bit more like my home, whereas YouTube is like the big, I don't know, corner square or town square where you can yell anything you want at anybody, but. Man, some of them are so harsh. So I just started collecting them, and then I'm like, "Well, why don't we? Why don't we sit down and let me share I, some of them with I you?" I loved it because it's it's you know exactly what you just said. From becoming minimum, I love how you said your small little blog. <laughs> don't millions come to this site each month? Uh, I don't know, something like that, I, something like that. But we don't need to start there. His small little blog, becoming <clears throat> minimum. <laughs> Um, but it must have been kind of shocking. And like, how do you deal with the comments now? Like, do you let them roll off? Do you block them? Do you let them stay there? What do you do? Oh, I, yeah, I, I don't worry about them too much. I, uh, I, I, I can get a little, I'm not too snarky, but I can get a little snarky sometimes replying to comments on YouTube. I, I feel, um, yeah, it's interesting. I guess when I'm on my own blog, and if someone says something negative, I usually just let it go and not think too much about it. But on YouTube, sometimes I'll snap back a little bit and try to have a little, not snap back in a mean way, but hopefully a little, a little levity with it. I, I guess you, I don't know, you feel a little smaller, I think, on the, in the YouTube universe than you do on, on your own little website where you own it and, and run it. So, um, totally. But yeah, they don't, they don't bother me too much. I, I like to read them and I, I mean, I like to read them back and share them with yeah. my wife and oh, I love uh, that stuff video. like that. So. And, uh, somebody also added, uh, Danielle wrote also the haircut one. When you talked about your hair, <laughs> when you had your, your hairstylist do it. Yeah. Um, and we did the, uh, we did the whole thing. Uh, yeah, that was a, that was a fun one. Um, the, the making the negative comments one was fun with Kim and then my hairdresser Lynn he's just uh he's just got a great personality and a lot of character and uh so I asked him if we could if I could read some of the negative comments to him while he uh while he cut my hair one time and um <laughs> so that turned out that I turned love out it it makes it so fun and yeah you know because yeah. we see your serious side and then I just I love seeing those too yeah um, so just for those of us a lot of us know you well. A lot of us dive into your content regularly. But for those that don't know, we talked about this before, could you just let us know in a nutshell like where this began and what sparked this concept of minimalism that has grown so much for you? 
Uh, so 14 years ago, um, I was living in Vermont, which is much closer to Maine than I am now. I'm in Come Phoenix. Back. You've got this, you got a beautiful summer day and it's going to be 105 here in Phoenix. So a wow. anyway, cu couple months out of the year, I'd like to switch with you, but anyway, okay. regardless. So I was up in new England. I'm actually a Midwestern guy, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota. That's where I grew up. But, uh, we lived in Vermont for six years and on a Saturday morning, I, uh, my son was five, my daughter was two and, uh, we had had this long winter, and then we had the um, annual Vermont mud season, and finally the sun was coming out, and so we were gonna, finally going to do our spring cleaning over Memorial Day weekend. Uh, short story is I offered to clean out the garage, thinking my five-year-old son would enjoy helping me. Uh, he lasted about 30 seconds, <laughs> and I I was just organizing everything in the garage, trying to get rid of stuff I didn't need and hose it down and organize it for the summer and hours took me hours. Uh, my son was alone begging me to play the whole time. And, uh, my neighbor June happened to be outside, uh, working on her house. And we had a short conversation and I was complaining about all the time that had gone into my project. And she said, you know, that's why my daughter's a minimalist. She keeps telling me I don't need to own all this stuff. And um, I looked at the pile of things in my driveway, dirty, dusty things that I knew weren't making me happy. I think we would all say our possessions aren't making us happy. Um, but out of the corner of my eye, then I see my five-year-old son swinging alone on the swing set in the backyard where he'd been all morning long and suddenly realized that all the things I'd owned, all the things I accumulated all the things that I wanted more of uh, were actually the very things that were distracting me from happiness and meaning and purpose and significance and joy. And um, I really think that's the, um, it's kind of the, the light bulb moment um, to go from, I don't know, just normal, typical American versus someone who's pursuing a more minimalist life. Like, we would all agree that we're not looking for happiness in possessions, or at least that's what we would all say. But that moment when we realize, hey, not only are these things not making me happy, but they're actually taking me away from a more meaningful life and a, and a happier life, that that's the moment where it makes sense to, okay, I'm going to purposefully, 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 and intentionally own fewer things so I can free up my life for better things, which... Can I ask you my first question now? Is yeah. your was your first YouTube video about minimalism? It was. <laughs> I, I I looked back because I thought to myself, when like how did this get started? And it was a video about minimalism. It was, and they were really short and they were very poor quality, but I felt very passionate about it once I yeah. learned about minimalism and I was trying to spread the word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and did you like the plan always was to start a YouTube channel or you just had like one video that you wanted to put out into the world? The original thing for me was I became a single mom back in 2014 and I was looking for lots of other videos to help me at this point in my life. Cause I, you know, you, you fight, start finding YouTube videos for everything. So I was like, well, mm -hmm. how do we, where are the other single moms and what are they doing? How am I figuring this out? And there was very little coming from single moms um, without, th that were really providing value and really helping others walk through it. So mm -hmm. I started watching minimalism videos because I was trying to like reel it in. You know what I mean? Like with all, like just with a little toddler and baby, like, okay, how can I, how can I manage this sure. better? And then also from a financial standpoint, what do I need to do to get the least stress and manage this home the best possible? So I started making frugal living videos slash with tones of minimalism to um, start helping others once I started getting a grip on it. And Got it. it started with that, but then it evolved into anybody that wanted to live this frugal yeah. lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. And now- 
Um, so I'm I'm meeting you for the first time. The, everyone else watching has known you for years, so maybe I shouldn't bore them with some of my questions. But did you did you just find that um, the frugal stuff resonated with people better? Like the way you talked about frugal living really resonated with people and comments and feedback. And you're like, hey, this is this is really helping people. I need to lean more into this. Yes, yep. that it. it connected a little bit more, but then there's I have um, <laughs> you'll see Sandra from Scotland in the in the comment. She has always been about minimalism. She's a minimalist, and there's a lot of this same community that loves minimalism videos. But the frugal living, for some reason, one of my videos, uh, my thirty fr frugal living tips, really took off, and it just ended up being kind of what I was embracing all the time. So it leaned a little bit more that way. But I always come back with a little bit of minimalism um, infused because yeah. I, I just I think it's such a beautiful practice and has been so useful and life changing. Yeah, I would think uh, there. I always say there's a lot of overlap. I whenever I talk about minimalism, I always say uh, minimalism isn't the same as being frugal. Uh, there are people who can be minimalists that are entirely the opposite of frugal. They still spend a lot of money on stuff. They just buy fewer things, but, but nicer things. Higher quality, um, yeah. uh, and there's, um, frugality, I think would, would lend itself into, uh, pursuing minimalism pretty, pretty naturally, but I suppose there can be some, um, some aspects of frugal living that, that do lend yourself to wanting to hold on to th things. Maybe. Could, it definitely could. Yeah. For me, I'm just, tr I'm trying to always, regarding my time, money, and energy, use my time, money, and energy sparing, sparingly on the things that don't matter so that I can spend abundantly on the things that do. My time, yeah. my money, and my energy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're great. You're, uh, you're fun and entertaining. And Do you well, wake up? You. Do you wake up? Do you wake up in as good a mood as you are on your videos? Often. Um, I'm a morning person now. I used to be the grouchiest, don't even look at me in the morning person, but having my son Caden has changed that. He wakes up with a big smile on his face. He bounds out of his bed and it's just kind of worn off on me. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Good, good. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. You were asking me stuff and then I oh, yeah. hijacked. Well, I mean, there's so many things that, um, l let me, uh, the case squad left me a lot of questions. So I'll ask a couple that might be quick and a couple that might take a little bit. Um, okay. So TA asks, is there one thing you miss in the smallest way about your non-minimalist life? Is there anything I miss? Um, uh, no, uh, no. I, I, I mean, there were there were probably things that I thought I was going to miss, although I'm trying to um, trying to put my finger on on what that was. And and I should be pretty clear. I'm not like I own ten things and I and I live in a I live in a tiny home. Like I uh, I've always taken a pretty rational approach to to minimalism, and um, so we still we still live up. At, live out in the suburbs. We just live in a smaller house out in the suburbs than, than we did before. And, um, uh, still, you know, we get to do more things, uh, more traveling than, than we would have done before, I think. Um, so no, I, I don't think there's anything that, that I miss things that maybe I thought I was going to miss, but things that just get, just get replaced. Um, so yeah, I don't know. What would I, what would I miss? Anything you can think of that I might miss? No, I think it's just so much better. Yeah. I miss cleaning out my garage. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you miss not having time with your kids. No, <laughs> less time with your wife. No, like, yeah. no. Yeah. No, um, that's a good question. I, that's a good question. Maybe if, maybe I'm just not thinking straight. Maybe if someone said, well, I, do you miss this? Do you miss that? Maybe something would come to my head, but I don't, I don't really think so. Um, my wife sometimes wants me to wear more colors than I do now. So I think she misses seeing me in red or something. 
Uh, she has different colors. She likes seeing me in, um, but. Do you only wear black? Uh, no, uh, no, black and white, black and white. And I, and I have a blue shirt. So I always have gray pants or khaki pants. And um, I always, if my shirt, my goal is always that all of my shirts will match my pants. And so I could wear anything with anything on any given day. I don't have like, oh, I can only wear this shirt with those pants. Um, so white and black always match the, um, the pants or the shorts that, that I own. And I only want black accessories, black accessories. Um, I think that cuts down on, on a lot of stuff that I need to buy if I'm like, well, I have to have a brown shoes to wear with that shirt. So um, so yeah, black and white. And then my wife bought me a blue shirt one time. She said, you know, blue matches everything you're wearing. And I'm like, oh, I suppose you're probably right. So we can, <laughs> we can add, that, add that to the list. But I only, I used one to just, shirt. but I only film my YouTube videos in um, black. I can't do white because it messes with the color. My, the person who runs the camera, uh, Gabriella, she runs the YouTube channel. She's like, I can't do white because it messes with the camera. Um, so just, yeah, because uh, Heather said, black. what's his favorite color since he's always wearing, would you say black is your favorite color or is it just the color you wear? Uh, you know what? That's an interesting one. Uh, I always say growing up navy blue. Uh, navy blue was my favorite color. I always thought it made me look taller. I, I don't know why, but I always liked, I always liked navy blue. Actually, do you have a favorite color is um, uh, a, a pet peeve question for my wife because whenever anyone asks me, what is your favorite color? I always, this is going to make me sound like a jerk. Uh, I always, but I think it's clever. I always say my favorite color of what? Like my favorite, my favorite color to wear is different than my favorite color car to drive or my favorite color to paint on the wall. So I always say, uh, it just makes me sound like a jerk now that, now that I try to explain it. No. My, favorite, my favorite color of what? There's no just favorite color. Favorite color to of see what? on the yes. grass? I like <laughs> green, but you know. So. Um, since you started becoming minimalist, what are your what are your three favorite things about your life now? Like, what has minimalism brought you that it's like your it's the favorite things about your life now because of minimalism? Uh, favorite things uh, about minimalism now. So. Uh, good question. I, I'm going to try to go back to, to when I started because I mean, it's 14 years. So yeah. I've written books and been out speaking on it. And so like, there's some things that I'm doing that, that I love now since becoming minimalist. But uh, at the very beginning, I would say I, um, uh, I loved, uh, I loved getting ahead financially. Um, uh, one of the the very first things, so we started in May, and I think by July or August, we had sold uh, a few things. We had done a garage sale, and I'm not a big fan of selling stuff, but selling selling bigger things. Uh, so we really had stopped spending money, and we had sold a few things, and we had gotten a little bit ahead financially in just three months. Like it doesn't take long, like it's shocking how much money we waste on things that we don't need. And, um, we did a, uh, we decided we debated a little bit on what to do with the money. I even put up a poll on the, on the blog one time, like, what should I do with the extra $600 or so that we've, that we've saved over the summer. And, uh, we decided to take a, uh, a beach vacation in, I don't know if it was New Hampshire or if it was, um, outside Boston or what, but we were in Vermont. So, so we could drive and we spent a night. So we get up early, drive, spend the day at the beach, spend the night, spend the next day and then drive home. And, uh, so we did that and it was a very, like a very practical example of how owning less stuff freed us up to do something really fun and really memorable and really important. Um, and so the, the saving money, which, you know, led, lead, lends itself to, I think, having some, some more fun experiences with the family. And then, uh, and then time, uh, the use of my time really changed, uh, less cleaning, less organizing, less shopping, less 
clicking around on websites, trying to find the best deal, um, just really uh, brought a lot of time into my life. And then the third thing, Kate, I, I think you'll say the same thing. I, I wonder if I hear it a little bit when you talk about being more of a morning person. Uh, I found that minimalism changed my habits in, in quite a bit, like waking up early, um, eating healthier, exercising more, like minimalism sparked those changes in my life. And it was, for me, it was intentionality in one area of life brought about intentionality in other areas of life. Um, and maybe that would have happened regardless, but like I can look back and see how minimalism led to, led to those three, led to those three things. And yours, what do you got on your list? Oh, that's a hundred percent. Um, well, you know, I loved in your book, how you were talking about being a stuff manager, spending mm. all the time managing the inventory of your home. If we, when we really sit back and we think about that, what a waste of time, mm -hmm. what a waste of time. So, um, the, so for minimalism, for, for me, I, I don't like knickknacks, Joshua. I don't like mm -hmm. stuff all over. I like the clean countertops. Mm -hmm. And I like how you encourage to like put all the small appliances away and keep all your, you know what I mean? Like keep all your, your countertops clean and sink empty and all like the whole thing like makes my life so much smoother. There's nothing, I think it was Leo Babauta said, there's nothing more demoralizing than a full sink in the morning. You, mm. were, were you a Leo Babauta friend fan any yeah. Of that. yeah 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 by the way the um the empty countertops is one of my uh people's least popular advice that i give oh, I do you, you you do you do you hear do you ever tell people to try out clean countertops and people say i'm never gonna do it right <laughs> or, do people, or do people or do people love you more and they're like whatever kate says so we're i gotta mix do it. i gotta mix <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it is, uh, honestly, it's, it's the one that when I tell people like, just clear your countertops every day. And they're like, I would never, I'm not going to put my toaster away. And that sounds so inconvenient. And I always think, I think you've never tried it. Like I, I, I you sound like you've never actually tried it and you'll probably like it more than you think. Maybe a couple things. I always think like the, the Keurig probably stays on the counter just because it gets heavy. But uh, my little drip coffee pot I, I put away um, when I'm done using it. But anyway, uh, yeah, I loved uh, I love Leo. Um, when I when I first found actually after my conversation with my June with June and I went back and like Googled how to be a minimalist or what does a minimalist home look like? Uh, Leo's was the very first article that I read uh, a guide to creating a minimalist home or something. I forget what exact title is. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first one. That was the first one that I read. And it, um, uh, I, you know, it was very, I think it, it painted a good picture. Like Leo's always so, uh, helpful, but anyway, uh, yes, I love Leo and any, uh, anything that I've ever done online, um, business wise or website design wise, I, I, I always look to Leo first. Like, how, what does Leo do? How does how does Leo do it? I, I love the way he so plain uh, and lived. easy to read, right? Yeah, I love the way he conducts himself online, and um, so that was um, yeah. He's the one I always looked to up uh, looked up to the most. Totally, and I don't remember what what wait. So, what year did you start your blog? Uh, I found minimalism on a Saturday and I started it on Monday. So 14 years ago, 2000 and well, what's now that we have to do the math, 2018, yeah. 2017, yeah. 2018, whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, okay. Cause I, and I, I don't remember when I started reading Zen habits, but the, the video that for you, that blew my mind, I thought I put it in my description here. Cause it was the first one when you're speaking at a church. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Um, mm -hmm. Oh, and, and, and when I when I heard you, because I think I was already looking at your blog, but when I heard you speak, I was like, oh, this is fantastic. This was just like, it just blew my mind. Oh, I thought I put it in there. Anyway, but I, I was just like, when I heard you tell the story and maybe we don't need all this stuff, I thought, oh, 
maybe I don't need all this stuff either. And I, the less I have physically, the less stress I feel, the more relaxed I feel. When I had a toddler, Joshua, oh my gosh. It was yeah. a, a toy show. Yeah. And I, because I ran into minimalist videos and I started adopting these, I was like, oh, he doesn't need all this stuff. If I could go back in time, right? Well, you, oh, you, you only came into it when, well, your kids were young still. Did you say five and three? Five, five and two, five and two. Yeah. two. But, oh my gosh. But I don't know if I should kind of move into this, but sometimes I think with, um, the same thing with money. And I love that you talk about money in your book, but sometimes I think maybe I don't need all this stuff. Maybe I don't need to make as much money as I think I do. Yeah. It, you talk about that in the book. And I think the K squad thinks about that a lot too. Um, yeah. Overcoming that desire to acquire more money. And, oh, I love the question you said, how often does your desire for acquiring more money influence your daily decisions? Yeah. Um, where are you on that now? Do you, are you, do you still think about that often, even currently? Um, yeah, man, that was a, uh, uh, that was a, that was a big one. Um, and it, I, I'm, I'm not sure I could trace the exact time where, where I started thinking about it. Although I, I think it was pretty early on. So, um, so I, I pastored before doing what I was a pastor for 15 years and, and loved doing that. Um, actually thought, thought I would always do it. I didn't, want to be a full-time writer or, um, full-time YouTuber or anything. Like I, like I, I love pastoring, but anyway, that's a completely different story. Um, so I don't think I ever, uh, chose a career because it would make me rich. Um, uh, no one becomes a pastor to make you rich. Well, at least most pastors don't do it to get rich. There's probably a few <laughs> unfortunate, um, souls out there, but, um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think money was always like just always a, a constant source of stress. Uh, 92% of Americans, I think, say that they have financial related stress. And um, and I, I always found that statistic to be fascinating that 90 to 92% of Americans would be financial related stress when we are the wealthiest nation in in the history of the world, at least statistically or at least we were before the current crash, like, like just more assets than any other country. And um, I'm like, why are 90% of the people in the wealthiest nation in the history of the world uh, stressed about money? It's not because we don't have enough money. There are some people that don't have enough money for sure, but it's not 92% of us. Most of us are doing... Uh, uh, ten th most of us have a thousand times more money than most of the people living in the world today. And yet for some reason, we're constantly stressed that we don't have enough. Why, why is that the case? Um, we have food, we have shelter, we have clothing, and yet we're stressed constantly about money. And my, my theory is that it's because we keep looking for money to provide something that it's never going to fully provide. We want money to provide happiness and security. And there's a level of security and happiness that, that money can bring, uh, but it's not enough to fully satisfy us. And so regardless, uh, so we look at people who have more money and we think, well, they must feel secure or they must be happier because they have more money. And so we, we get focused on getting to that financial level where we'll finally feel secure and we'll finally feel happy. And we work really hard and we make sacrifices and we focus on making money. And sometimes we get to that level and we realize that we're not any happier and we don't feel that much more secure. 87% uh, of people with a 87% uh, of millionaires in America say that they're not wealthy. And so we get to that level and we, we don't feel secure and we don't feel any happier. And so rather than saying, 
hey, maybe I'm looking for happiness and security in the wrong thing. Uh, we just think to ourselves, oh, I just had the wrong number. And actually, I need this much in my bank account or I need this much coming in. And then finally, I'll feel secure and happy. And so because of that, we're, we're always stressed that we don't have, we're, our lives aren't as happier as they could be if we just had, if we just had more money. So um, minimalism certainly played into that, learning that, hey, I could be happier with less. Uh, my life is better owning less. And so I don't need as much money naturally to, to support that lifestyle. And so what is enough and what does that look like? And um, why am I constantly stressed about, why am I stealing joy from today, constantly stressed about not having enough money for tomorrow when, I don't know, for some reason, I always seem to have enough when it gets to it. Yes, um, I love that you, You've mentioned the quote by Jim Carrey. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they see that it's not the answer. I I love that, Who, like you said, who else could say that? Jim Carrey could say that. And I think that's what a lot of people are still like searching for. Like they think that that's the answer, but they're just as miserable. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Zig Ziglar said uh, something pretty similar. He said, uh, money won't make you happy, but everybody wants to find out for themselves. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think it's, uh, I think it's very true. Like Jim Carrey, I, like I'll post the quote Jim Carrey says, I wish, I wish everyone could become rich and famous so they could discover it's not the answer. And the comments are, well, easy for him to say, well, he should give me his money then. Uh, well, who's he to tell me that when he has more money than he can ever spend? And, and my response is always, who else can tell you that? Like you, someone who, who, uh, who's struggling financially can't tell you that that money isn't, I suppose they could, but like, um, it's someone who has gotten there and can tell you, Hey, it's not, it's not worth it. And yet, even as I say it, people are like, well, I'd still like to give it a shot. I, you know, <laughs> Everyone tells me money won't make me happy, but I'd, I'd like to find out for myself. Right. But I, I love like when you're, <laughs> when I got your book, by the way, like I just cascaded over to chapter six. So that, that first thing, mm. and I do that choreographically. I don't think you know this about me, Joshua, but I also am a dance teacher and choreographer on the side. And so sometimes I'll choreograph my dance routines in the middle and then I'll go to the end and then I'll go back to the beginning. And I do that with books yeah. too sometimes. <laughs> Because I'm strange, but anyway. What, uh, uh, and and what do you? Uh, what kind of dance do you choreograph? All of them, or hip hop, jazz, contemporary, and lyrical primarily. For like a like a theater. Yeah, mostly club like or well, a dance, dance studios, class? mostly teenagers studios. primarily. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's bet. another thing about me. <laughs> oh, how fun! How fun of a choreographer would you be? You'd be fun, right? I I'm think, sure you're. I'm sure you're. I think they have terrible. fun. I they just asked me to do another piece this summer. I'm like, I'm down, absolutely. Right, right. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. But I think on our channel, we often are wondering when is enough enough, and like we are, a lot of us are striving to have an emergency fund. Uh, oh, you also said in your book, Greg McBride said. Nothing lets you sleep better at night than knowing you have money tucked away to cover unplanned expenses. You said, I agree, but is it possible to save too much? Do you think it's possible to save too much? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, this is very, so this is very uh, theoretical in nature and um, trying to figure out how, how to write this. Uh, was very difficult because I, I want to be practical and I want to be helpful. Um, but I, uh, I'll get to my end point here in a moment. But um, knowing exactly how to tell people how much to save or how much they shouldn't save is, is really difficult. And I, I don't even know if there is a specific answer. But when you think about it, Kate, um, saving money at its core, the, the very definition of saving money is I'm saving my money today for a need that may or may not arise in the future. 
And this is wise and this is smart and we shouldn't spend every penny that comes in. Like we should save like a, like the ant stores up food for the, for the winter, right? Like, like it's, it's smart to do this. However, me saving my money for an unforeseen or, or a need that may or may not arise in the future is always at the expense of somebody's very real need today. Like I could, I could save the hundred dollars this month um, for my retirement, but there, there's a homeless family. There's, there's a, a family in poverty in my community today that really could use that money right now. And so how do we, how do we balance these two thoughts in our mind? And so can we get to a point where we save, where we're saving too much? I, I think we can, um, especially if it's, I just want to have as much money as I possibly can. And so I'm, so I'm saving everything. Um, or I, I can't wait to stop working. And so I'm just saving as much money as I can so I can retire as, as early as, as possible, as opposed to just, embracing the, the benefit of work in a way. And so, um, all that to say, if, if I could get to the end point, I, I, I don't think any of us, um, my goal is always to err on the side of generosity, um, with my life. And, uh, if I could get to the point in my life where did I keep more than I needed or did I help more people than I should have? Like I would, I would prefer to, to, to be on the, I helped more people than I should have rather than I, I, I collected more for myself than I should have. So uh, like, I always want to be careful here and just reiterate what I said. It is wise to save and it's smart to save. And I, I think if we don't have some of these minimalist principles in place, then it can become very easy to to overspend and not save anything and just buy everything that I want. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about not saving anything for unplanned uh, or needs that may or may not arrive in the future. I'm just, hey, let's just remember uh, what this uh, what this means and um, what I could be doing with the money instead and try to find some sort of healthy healthy balance. Although I think most people kind of fall into the not there's some people I think I, I've heard from a few people who think that their parents gave away too much money. Um, but that's a pretty, a pretty small percentage of people that <laughs> err on the side of giving away too much. So anyway, that's a long, that's a long <laughs> conversation. Well, but thank you for that. I do think you help your, your audience have a more generous heart. And I appreciate, I personally appreciate that because I came from a background where I often was not sure I would have enough. Um, my, my family situation would kind of fluctuate, like we'd be great and then all of a sudden we wouldn't be. And I wouldn't know what spectrum of that we're on at certain times. And then as I grow, grew older, I think I became better with money and my parents will even say that because I knew they would say, learn from us, but don't do what we did. Learn from us, though, because sometimes uh, I, I wanted to, you know, create a nice, stable life going forward. But I also used to hold my money so tight, Joshua, because what if I didn't have enough? Like, that's how I used to feel. But since starting this channel and K-Squad, you all watching, you guys know I have a, I have a giving category because I don't want to do that anymore. And I've stopped doing that and kind of like what you also said in your book, you had an exercise to try about, you know, if you, if you don't think you have enough, is it okay if I pair, I'm going to try to paraphrase and tell me if I'm wrong, but like taking $5 a week and giving it to somebody that needs it and then do that for a few weeks and you'll realize you still have enough. Once you realize you have enough, try giving $10 away and you'll realize you still have enough and kind of in increments becoming gradually more giving will be everything. Yeah. I, I, I think it's the, uh, I think it's the greatest benefit of generosity, at least the greatest personal benefit of generosity is 
the realization that we have enough. Um, it's, it's, that's what that does. Like when you can put uh, a giving category in your budget, even if it's just $5 or $10 or whatever it is, add five or $10. Like when it's, when it's there and you're consistently giving something away um, every single, every single month, then there's just in the back of your mind of, okay, I have, I have enough. As a matter of fact, I have so much that I can actually be giving some away. Um, and I, I think it loosens some of that grip of, I need more. I need more. Uh, I need more to feel secure. I need more to feel secure. Uh, it's like, Hey, wait a minute. I, I actually have enough already that I can even give some away. Um, I think it's pretty helpful. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to kind of shift into another part of your book because there just so, there was so much in your book. And I, I know we're not talking all about your book, but there was so much in your book that I thought, wait, why did he put this in here? And then I was like, because I was like, oh, I don't need that chapter. And I'm like, oh, I really need this chapter. Like I was, I was like, I just thought, I thought it was filled with surprises. That's what I felt like. Mm. And it was like wonderful surprises. And one of the chapters is called Overcoming the Distraction of Leisure. And I'll tell you a quick embarrassing kind of, it's not that embarrassing, but slightly embarrassing story. Back when I lived in Florida, I was living um, with some of my friends, my young fun days. And we were, I had two jobs. I had a job in the morning and I had a job at night. And so in between, we were floating around the pool in, and I was just, we we're just sunbathing. And I said, oh, I wish I had a million dollars so I could do this every day. And my friend looked at me and he's like, why do you need a million dollars to do this? You're doing it right now. And I was like, but I wouldn't, I'd feel less guilty about doing this. Like if I had a million dollars banked up, does that, can anybody relate K squad? You know, does anybody have that feeling like you feel guilty about having this leisure time unless you've kind of put the work in kind of thing? Um, by the way, this is the, this is my friend here. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> Size the one that said that to me. He's like, you don't need. Oh, that's funny. You don't need a million dollars to do that. Yeah. But you're saying in your book, the goal of work isn't more rest. The goal of rest is to work better. Did you get any buddy with weird comments after this, or or people like, yes? Did I get any editor to vet what I was what I was trying to say to make sure it made any sense? Uh, no. Um, um, no, I haven't gotten, I haven't gotten a, a, uh, maybe one, maybe one negative comment that, that I saw. And I've kind of stopped reading the, uh, the reviews on, on the book. Someone asked me if I read reviews on the books that I write. And I said that I always read them for the first couple months because I want to know like what points are really resonating with people, uh, what points are being misunderstood or um, misapplied or mistaken yeah. just because I know I'm going to talk on the book and speak on it and do interviews. And so like just knowing, Hey, what, what are, what are the points that people really resonate and what are the people that need some clarification? And so I, I think maybe one person was like, what's he expecting me to work until I die? Something like that. <laughs> um, which, yeah, but anyway, um, no, you know what it, um, okay. So like, let's just trace this conversation here. Cause it's brilliant. Cause it really, even trace my, my thought process. I own less stuff. I, I need less money. Uh, and so then my next question becomes like, what's the, what's the point of work if I don't need a lot of money to go buy a lot of stuff? Like how, what is the role of work in our lives? If it's not just to go buy a whole bunch of stuff that we don't need. Um, and, and really, um, uh, number of things I list out in the book and just some different conversations and different things that I read. Like what, what I began to realize is that, uh, work that it, it's a uh, pretty common to view work through a, a pretty selfish lens. Like in our society, work has become pretty selfish. Uh, work has become the thing that I do to make the money so that I can, uh, buy the house or make the money so that I can go on the vacation or 
make the money so that I can uh, retire as early as possible or make the money so that I make enough money so I can go lay in the pool all day long. Like, like as work is what I do for the thing that I get out of it. Uh, but in reality, work is, work is, um, like selfless, like, or, or at least at least it sh could be and should be viewed as selfless work is me doing what I'm good at so that someone else can do what they're good at work is me putting in the effort benefiting other people so they can put in effort benefiting other people. And in the long run, all of society benefits and we all move forward and everybody is served well by everybody doing uh, what they're good at and what they're passionate about. And uh, in this way, work is, work is love. I, 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 like, I think work is love. I think if we would view the work that we do as love to other people, rather than the paycheck I get at the end of it. Uh, I think we find more fulfillment in it. And I think we find more meaning in it. And it, it becomes more enjoyable. It becomes um, something to look forward to more than just laying on a beach every day for the rest of my life. Uh, work becomes the opportunity for me to, uh, to love other people. Um, and so I, uh, so yeah, I, I would, I would think that, um, for me that when, when we begin to take that view, you know, work doesn't become the thing I do so I can rest more, but rest becomes a thing I do so that I can do better work serving uh, other people. I'm, I mean, I'm sure you feel the same about this YouTube channel, right? Like, like, like you would much rather do this than lay on the beach. That doesn't mean there's no time for laying on the beach and there's no time for floating in the pool. Uh, but all day long, I don't know. There's, there's people that, that I can help. And there's things that I've learned that, that I want to share with others. Absolutely. I think this YouTube has, this YouTube channel has taught me that because I love doing this. I also love choreographing, but the things that spark excitement and the things that get other people excited with you and people, you know, you can um, get excited together, you know, share some values uh, and also just help each other's lives run smoother I think the case squad, like we all know that if we, you know, not every family member wants to talk about money and, and frugal living or even minimalism, I'm sure like that it gets to a point where they, they don't all want to talk about it, but they always know this is their safe place to come. Right guys, you can always come here. We talk about it. We can ask questions. And th this is what I enjoy doing more than, more than most things, you know, this yeah. is like right up there. Like I truly so enjoy it. And so then let me, let me jump in just because I know from reading negative comments, what, uh, what like some of the misinterpretations are here about what I mean by that. Uh, when I talk about work, uh, I don't always mean a nine to five job. I don't always mean, uh, getting paid for something even like my wife, uh, she's been a stay at home mom since, uh, since Salem was born and like, she works as hard as I do and and doesn't get paid for it but that that's still her doing what she's good at serving others helping others i think that the volunteering at a volunteering with our time is an example of of doing this um so it's i, I don't always mean like being at work in your job I, I think that i just talk about embrace effort is the way i the way i say it and and your work will look different based on talents and skills and abilities. And, um, so yeah, hope that's helpful. Well, and I'm glad you're mentioning the nine to five part. Cause I also, I'm, I'm, I'm an administrative assistant by day and YouTuber by afternoon, evening, morning, every other parts of the day. But a lot of people I've been watching online lately, um, you know, they just have the great resignation or that's still kind of going on. And a lot of people, you know, have quit their job for, for other um, adventures or et cetera. But like, I do think that if we take what you are sharing as an attitude about work, uh, the way to overcome the distraction of leisure is to rethink it and find selfless fulfillment in work. If we could do that, even with those of you that claim to hate your nine to fives, which you might, and there might be very valid reasons for that. But if you can apply, go in there, be the love, be, you know, put that, put that attitude 
of that you are there to serve and you're putting out goodness in the world, even into your nine to five, I think it could make it more meaningful. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think there are very few jobs in in the world that aren't genuinely helping other people. And so if you can if you can see that, you know, oh, I'm 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 I, I, I don't love every aspect of my job, but you know what I do? I, I help people in this way. I, um, I hate being on my feet all day, but because I do this, it helps this neighbor. It, it helps these people do this thing. Uh, I think the more we see that, the uh, more fulfillment we find. I think so too. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple other questions. Well, I, I could go on for days, but let me just, let me pop into my questions that they had asked. Marsha Hampbell asks, what is Joshua's biggest splurge as of lately? Have you had any splurges, anything you've spent money on that was like a little bit of a bigger thing? Everything feels like a splurge. A Doesn't everything feel like a splurge? Uh, ground beef <laughs> feels like feels like a splurge. Um, uh, what is my latest splurge? Well, uh, so... I'm going on a I'm going on a book tour this summer. Um, I did it with each of my books, and this one we're doing uh, the Midwest. And so I always do. Uh, I take my family. My parents are coming with this time, as a matter of fact. So it's usually me, my wife, and two kids. And then we we do an event in the city, and then the next day we do something fun in the city, and then we drive three or four hours, do an event in the evening see the city, drive three or four hours, do an event and see the city. So, I mean, the last couple of weeks I've been filling in some of those things. Yesterday, we, uh, I reserved the swamp tour while we're in New Orleans, which costs a little bit more, a little bit more to ride on the airboat than I thought it was going to, I thought it was going to cost. So when I think of splurges lately, I think of, uh, we're going to be in Chicago over 4th of July and um, we're like, well, how are we going to know where to go watch the fireworks in Chicago? So we, um, we're like, well, let's just, let's get on one of the, the cruises, like not the big cruise, but like the three hour cruise and go watch it from the water. So we bought tickets for that. So anyway, for the next couple Whoa. of weeks, we have a few little I love things it. that I wouldn't normally do. That's like a dream of mine. Although I, I is to go on a book tour. I'd have to write a book first. Like how exciting is that? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's great. I mean, is yeah, it it's great. Been, uh, depends. Yeah. Yeah. It can be, it can be exhausting. Depends a little bit on how well you spread it out and yeah. what help you have and how much you're doing yourself. The, the first couple ones, I would just do it in bookstores. So just find a bookstore and then they would host me. And in those cases, it's not too bad as long as you're okay with being in front of people and, you know, meeting a bunch of people, you show up and uh, I always do a, a talk and then uh, sign some books. And so it can be a little tired by the end of the day, but it's not like you're. And how many, how many months chairs. does that last? Uh, we always just do a couple of weeks. Um, cool. So two and a half weeks uh, is what this one's going to be July 1st. And then we end July 19th. So yeah, two and a half weeks. That is so cool. Um, next question. I've got Preston asked, I'm curious about his wife. Uh, oh no. There was one that wanted to know, where did you meet your wife? Where did you guys meet? Where did you and Kim meet? There was another part of that question. Now I can't find it. How did I propose? Yeah, that was what it was. Where did you meet and how did you propose? Uh, um, we met at church. Uh, actually, uh, long story, we, we met at church. I was a senior in high school. She was a freshman. Um, and so we met and uh, we were just friends. And then I went to college, but I stayed in town. Um, and we, uh, we, uh, we started dating after she graduated high school because she was going to go to the same college as I was. So we knew each other pretty well that one year in high school and then kind of went separate ways. And then um, after she graduated and went back to college again is when we started when we started dating. Um, my uh, my proposal, uh, Kate, I um, I I had I laid out 52 
actually 53 balloons. Uh, inside 52 of the balloons, I wrote out a reason that I loved her. Um, and then there was one uh, silver balloon in the middle. And so then uh, she would pop the balloons and uh, it would explain a reason why I loved her. Uh, and then the last balloon had her uh, had the engagement ring inside of it. I'm not crying. Squad, you're crying. <laughs> that is so sweet. I love it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So how long you've been married now? Uh, just celebrated 23 years uh, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, 23 years. Yeah. That is amazing. I, lo I love it when I, like I said, like in the, in the comments, she just seems like such, her demeanor just seems to match yours, but I don't know because it's just on camera, but are you similar in like disposition or no? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, incredibly similar values and desires and passions and, um, and, and, and things that we want our life to be about. We're very similar and there's plenty of overlap, I think, between things that we like to do. But no, I, I mean, I like being on stage and I like being in front of the camera and Kim doesn't. Kim wouldn't ever choose it. If I asked her to make a video with me, she would she would do it, but she would never uh, choose it on her own. Like, yes, let's um, do this. Yeah. And I tend to be, um, uh, yeah, more like... Um, yeah, that's just a, a good example. She's she's yeah. real good with details, and I'm not nearly as good with details as as she is. But yeah, both like being around people, and um, so. Well, Doris wants to know how do you manage stress. How do I manage stress, uh, Kate? I, 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 I don't get very stressed. Uh, I, I, I don't have much stress in my life, so. Um, I should start there. If, uh, how do I manage stress? I don't know. I don't have anything in place. I, I like to work out. I, I go to the gym I, most mornings before, before going to work. And, uh, I find that to be, to find that be pretty helpful. Um, just time to, um, recalibrate and rethink about things. I also go to church every Sunday. I, uh, I think that we actually moved this up an hour because um, yeah. uh, plenty of time, plenty of time. I'm not rushing this along, but like we were going to do a different time. I'm like, well, actually I go to church on Sunday morning. So can we do an hour earlier? Um, so that's where I'll go after this. But um, I, yeah, that's always been, my faith has been pretty important and, and helpful. And uh, I think that that helps alleviate a lot of stress and anxiety in my life as well. So I should point to that. That's wonderful. Um. Doris also um, just kept to ask. She says, "Have you always been this handsome?" Have I always been this <laughs> handsome? Well, that's hard for me to hard for me to hard for me to answer. Uh, we had to ask, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I I don't know. What are you gonna do? I was I was pretty scrawny. I was pretty little as a kid. Um, I didn't really grow until even maybe my senior year of of high school. So. I was probably a little too skinny for most of my years. Did you do years. sports like in high school, did you say? I played tennis. tennis. I played tennis. So I have a twin brother and he was starting tight end on the football team and I played tennis. So that pretty much describes well, our high school years. That's so one of our um, comments dazzled us, asked, are you much like your twin brother personality interests goal wise? Uh, yes, we're very similar. Although we, we look nothing alike. He's <laughs> six, four, he's six, four, two twenty. uh, really broad shoulders and he's bald and, and he's bald. <laughs> I'm, and I'm, I'm entirely not that. And yeah, he was star of the football team and basketball team. And I was on the tennis team. So, uh, I think he got a lot of, a lot more attention in high school. If he was, if he was hanging out, if we were, I would say if we were juniors and he was hanging out with the seniors, I was hanging out with the freshmen. So that's, oh. <laughs> that's, how, our, that's how our high school years looked. What's that? Do you have any more siblings or is that everybody? Uh, I have a sister one year younger. 
Uh, my brother and I were born on December 11th, and my sister was born December 13th the following year. So there were three of us within a year and two days. Love that. Um, we, we talk about like fr obviously frugal living and kind of, you know how you were kind of saying like saving like a little bit, I forgot what your analogy was. You saying like, like a, did you say squirrel or you said something, somebody's stocking up a little oh, bit. Like an ant, like an ant. Like an ant. That's okay. You an said ant. that earlier. Christy was wondering, um, how you do your meals and do you stock up at all? Like with groceries and everything right now, like, do you, do you stockpile in your house? Do you go grocery shopping every week? Like what kind of, what's your situation with that? Uh, no, I'm not a big stockpiler probably because I never know what I'm going to cook for dinner. I'm probably at the grocery store three or four times a week. Okay. Oh, you are three or four yeah. times a week. Yeah. But not, but not like big. Like I never have a full cart. I'm like, Oh, you know what we should have tonight. Uh, we have everything we need except the honey. So I'll just stop at the grocery store on the way and it's right on the way. So I just pull in and grab whatever I need. So, and, and what's your favorite meal? Like if you said you're having this tonight, like, oh, tacos, you can have one meal. what is it? Tacos. Ta oh yeah. 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 Oh, tacos, always. you are a guy after our own heart. And then just while we're on the, the topic of preferences, I like to know this about people regarding peanut butter, creamy or crunchy. Mm. Oh, I is creamy. People do crunchy. Yeah. You're creamy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That's I another mean, reason I like you. I, 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 I don't even know how crunchy makes it to be honest. It, I don't know who's buying that stuff. I don't either. It's, it's not right. <laughs> um, the, the, just the last topic I just want to touch base on with, with, because I, when I read again in the book, I was like, why would I? And then I was like, oh, I do need this. Overcoming the distraction of applause. Mm, mm. Um, and you're saying you don't need praise or attention to have value. Mm -hmm. And um, you also mentioned that people are attracted to others who are living their mission, which I think is true. I think that it's illustrative and what's happening right in this moment. But yeah. What was your biggest lesson with that overcoming the distraction of applause? <clears throat> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I can tell you the moment where I, I learned this um, and then some different ways that it, it can play out in life. Um, so it happened when I'd been blogging for a while and I, I reached a couple pretty significant milestones. Uh, I, I released a book that, that did really well. Um, and then, um, yahoo.com decided to run a story on a different minimalist blogger than me. And they were on the, the front page of yahoo.com. And then they were on different shows. And, uh, I, like, I was, I was really jealous uh, and envious. And I was like, how come Yahoo, did a story on that blogger rather than me. Like I, I think my blog's bigger and I just had this book and um, I was here first. And so <laughs> like, like how come, how come that, that person's getting all the notoriety than, than I am. Um, and uh, like, I really wrestled with like, why, like, why is this? And not just, not just why were why was that person picked? But why am I so jealous? Like I could feel it in my life. And anyway, um, <clears throat> Anne Lamont is a, a writer and I happen to be at a, a writer's conference, maybe two or three weeks later. And someone asked her a question about negative reviews. How do you handle negative reviews? And uh, her response was, um, if you are looking for your fulfillment, in other people's opinions of you, you will never find it. And I got to thinking about the last couple weeks of my life. And I was like, that's exactly what I'm doing. It's, but it's in a, in a different way than reading negative review. It's, Hey, how come I feel like something is missing in my life because I'm not getting as noticed as that person is other people's opinions uh, are changing the way I, I find my fulfillment. And um, so that was probably the, 
the impetus that that eventually led to led to that chapter and i actually start the chapter with that story in a little more detail but yeah um you know the way it looks in our lives so the whole book uh things that matter uh overcoming distraction to pursue a more meaningful life is when we get focused on uh pursuing those other things when we get uh uh, focused on always wanting more money or wanting more things or wanting more rest or wanting more accolades. Like when that becomes the focus, then we tend to make different decisions than if we were just trying to uh, pursue our most meaningful life, uh, a life that brings about the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Uh, because the things that bring me money aren't always going to be the same things that bring me meaning in life. And I could do things that would bring me more fame. I could do things that would bring me more praise or more accolades, or I could even write articles that would bring about more clicks online or make videos that would bring about more views. But that's not necessarily the most meaningful work that I could be doing or even the most helpful thing that I could be creating. Um, and so finding that, finding that balance uh, in, in much the same way that, that money plays into this, like, like we should be honestly compensated for our work. So do good work and money will follow, like help people. And, and the money is going to be there. Um, do good work and people are going to notice you doing good work, but don't sacrifice meaningful work just for more money. Uh, don't sacrifice meaningful work just for more accolades or praise or uh, the attention of others, because rarely is that the uh, most important work that you can be doing. Yes. Oh, I love that. And I, like I said, when I, when I started to read it, I was like, I don't know if I, yeah. And when you shared that story, I was like, I love that you could be so honest and share that story because that's like a like a people often don't like to talk about their feelings of jealousy and we all we it's such a human thing we all feel it and we talk about that all the time even on the channel about like keeping up with the joneses you know that whole concept and us seeing on social media like oh you know, the neighbors just got the new boat and the neighbors just got this new car and just, oh, maybe I, maybe I'm not as good because I don't have that. And, oh, she's got this new outfit and the new shoes and the new bag. And I don't have that. So I feel less than, yeah. and we feel that all the time, like that comparison thing, but also the need for the accolades. And even me uh, as a channel, there's been other channels that started after me and just took off and we're talking about the same things. But for whatever reason, or whatever, why was that? Per why would the, why were they chosen for that Yahoo article at the time? You know, it's just. But we got to just keep putting our best work out there, and the, those that need the, those messages will come to us, and just do our yeah. best. Yeah, yeah. But it, <clears throat> but it's hard sometimes, especially the comparison game. So do you do you feel now because of just the the life you've created that you're that you experience that less as a minimalist and just as being Joshua Becker now, because you're more confident and comfortable with what you have. So I think, yes. I mean, I think that this is how we overcome envy and how we overcome jealousy is when we know we're doing the things when we know we're doing the best with what we have, or when we know that we're directing our, money and time and energy towards things that matter, that this is how we overcome envy and jealousy. And so uh, if, I, um, if I give my money to go help a nonprofit uh, or help solve a problem that I see in the world or help a friend who I know needs help, and I give my money there, and then my neighbor buys a boat. I'm less envious that my neighbor bought a boat because I know that I used my money for things that were good. And I, I knew that it was going towards things that actually mattered. If I took my money and I bought a bigger screen television and then 
um, my neighbor buys a boat, maybe there's a little more of, oh, maybe, maybe I should have saved up for the boat rather than the television. Um, but when we, when we're directing our, our resources towards things that, that we know are meaningful, then it's easier, I think, to, to let other people buy the things they want because I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to with my money. And then the same way, I think, with our time and our talents and our energy and our focus and, hey, I'm doing what I feel like I'm called to do. And regardless of how many people notice that, regardless of how much attention I get from it, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm doing what I know I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and so I think that, that that person can do what they want and they can get the notoriety that they want. Um, and maybe I, I wish I had it, but it's okay because I know I'm here doing uh, what I'm supposed to be doing and uh, whether anybody notices it or not. Yeah. And even in that chapter, you were saying to like help others be bigger. And I thought that was yeah. a great concept too. Yeah. You know, I, I think the more we, and I, I, I found that a lot online, you know, um, helping, you know, helping other bloggers get their, get their name out there and um, promoting what other people are, are doing. Uh, I think that allows us to share a little bit in, in their success. And uh, even if they, grow bigger than us, you know, there's a part of knowing that, Hey, I got to, I got to be a part of that uh, as yeah, well. Definitely. I could talk to you obviously for hours and hours, but I'm just, Joshua, I'm so grateful you came and spent time with us today. This was so enjoyable. Thank you for being here. Well, you know, the whole story is, um, you said really nice things about me in a video and then, um, the K squad kept popping over to invite me over. I, um, the K squad. When did you, when did you start calling them the K squad? The K squad happened within, within the first year, within probably right. within the first new, few months or something. I was like, I kept calling them and I'm like, guys, what can we, what can I call you? Because I don't want to just call, I, we, we came mm. up, we kind of came up with this name together Got it. back when I had maybe, I don't guys, what was it? Like, maybe 3000 subscribers, maybe. <laughs> Cause you, uh, you're right. You're, you're tired of calling them guys and girls or whatever. So that right. makes, that makes good sense. So then they started popping over and then, um, and then I did a live, I did a, I did a YouTube live and, and you were there, I think it was on YouTube. Um, and you were there and, uh, I knew the name right away. And you're like, Kay, well, Kay. let's and make I was it, like, let's oh, make it happen. My name. Let's make it happen. So, I, uh, it, no, I, I'm, I appreciate you. Thank you for, um, all the kind words that, that you've said. And I watched a couple of your videos and your book was in my book was in your background. And so anyway, I'm, <laughs> I'm really thankful, but, um, man, I, uh, Did yeah, you guys I, I, was, see I was thinking, here? <laughs> yeah, right there. That's the important one right there. Um, you always have such, Oh, good energy and good fun. And obviously hanging out with you is going to be as fun as, um, as fun as it looked like it was going to be. So oh, th thank you so much for being here. I, like I said, I could go on for days, but I know you, I know you've got somewhere to go in a little bit, but just, uh, we appreciate you. We'll always be checking out your content and we will continue to support you. And we just, it's really been nice getting to know you here. And I've just, I've just really enjoyed our conversation. Well, enjoy your summer in Maine. Enjoy your summer in Maine. Absolutely. And good luck on the book tour. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Joshua. K-Squad, everybody say bye. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua. Have a great day. Uh, bye now. Bye.